Okay, now I uh, saw a piece which has to do with, with uh, our topic of tefillah in the Ben Yishchai. So if you take a look at the first page that you have, it says, Ayin Ches. Ayin Ches. Right. So he's quoting the Pasuk in this this week's parsha Mishpatim. I I wrote it in uh, handwritten on top of the page, the first part of the Pasuk. That's the Pasuk. And uh, everybody understand that? Vavatem es Hashem Elokeichem. And you will worship your God, Uberach es Lachmachov, and He will bless your bread, Vesmeimecha, and your water, Vasiroisi Machla Mikubecha, and He will remove sickness from you. So all of this is dependent on the first part of the person. Vavatem es Hashem Elokeichem. If you will serve, Hashem, your God, then all of the results will be your bracha in your bread and your water, and there will be still no sickness. Okay. The first part of the pasuk is what we have to concentrate on right now. What is avoda? We know, as I see, if you see on the second line, in the written, handwritten, avoda equals tvila. We learned this from Kriya Shema. In Kriya Shema, we say. You have to worship God with your entire heart. Correct? What is Avoda Shabalei? What is God, worship with the heart? So Chazal say, uh, worship with the heart is tefillah, prayer. Which tells us what? Right, that we are supposed to be praying not only with our minds, not only by, but Avoda Shabalei. It means with our heart and our minds, that means you have to be rationally and emotionally attached to Hashem that you are talking to at the time when you're praying. So you have to have your heart and your mind <sighs> attached to Hashem. That is a vote Okay. Okay. Shalom, shalom. Shalom. <clears throat> So we're waiting for you. So come, come quick. We're waiting for you. Waiting for you. Thank you. No, so sit down, sit down. I will. Give me a little page. Rabbi? Yes. Doesn't the mind have to teach the heart? How well, the, well, well, the mind is supposed to control the heart, but yeah, they have to have both elements there. You have to have both elements there. A Jew is not a robot. Right? A Jew is not a robot. A robot works only with a mind, with no heart at all. But we have a heart. Our heart is an energy center, an important energy center. And we have to direct the energies of the heart also to worship Hashem. So they have to work in conjunction with each other. The mind and the heart have to work together. And it's called in Chazal, Avodah Shibbalev, service of the heart. Why the heart is mentioned more so than the mind is a very interesting question. I'm not sure that I have the answer, but we very seldom have reference to the mind in the Torah by a specific word. We never say moach. In the Torah, you don't find sukkim to talk about the moach, talk about the rosh. We talk about always the lev. Always the lev is picked as the representative of the person. But it means, of course, his heart and his mind. It can't be only the heart. The heart is what we seem to be thinking only it was a muscle that pumps blood, but it's much more than that. It's much more than that. <clears throat> I'll tell you something absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> <coughs> 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 
There was a Jewish non-religious doctor. Uh, I've, I'm not sure if it's biology or something in that area. His name is Dr. Bruce Lipton. Anybody can find him on the internet. A very, very interesting person. Maybe today he is becoming religious. I don't know. I think he's been here in Israel lecturing. And he came up with an absolutely amazing, amazing piece of information. They did a, uh, I think it was a heart transplant of a, a, a young girl who needed a, another heart. Her heart was not functioning, malfunctioning, and they did a heart transplant. After they did the, the transplant and, and she recovered, she began having all kinds of uh, dreams or I don't remember exactly what it was, something of that nature, maybe thoughts, dreams. I mean, it's been a while since I uh, had the original information from this fellow Bruce Lipton. I got it over the internet and they took her to all kinds of doctors because it was disturbing her sleep and so on and so forth. But they found out that these thoughts that this young girl was having were the thoughts of the girl who they took the heart from. Hmm. You hear that? The heart is not just a muscle that pumps blood. The heart ha seems to have some kind of intelligence, internal intelligence of its own, an entire system. And that remained with that heart that they took out of one person, put it into another person, and that person's original heart was taken out because it was malfunctioning. And the new heart was associated with the lifestyle of the previous person. And it came with the heart to the new person. That's absolutely amazing. I heard somebody say the same thing. He said, I, I have cravings and desires I've never had before. After we had a heart transplant? Yeah, heart transplant. I'm not surprised. <laughs> I'm not surprised. So when the Torah says, Avoda is Tvila Shebalev, it wants you to harness all of those energies that may have some kind of intelligence of their own and connect it to the mind, and that is Tvila. Well, what is the manifestation of the heart? I understand the mind is thinking. Is, what is the fruit of the heart? What's the manifestation? How do you know it's your heart? What is, you understand what I'm saying? When I'm thinking with my mind, I know it's my mind thinking this and that and that. But when you say the heart like that, I understand what you're saying, but how does that manifest itself? How do I know that's the heart? Well, Tanya says that the heart is the seat of self-centeredness and selfishness. Well, uh, we are only conscious of the, um, the mental faculties that we have but we do know that when we have certain kinds of mental activity going on we see the symptoms in our heart when you're very upset or very happy your heart beats differently than when you're relaxed right? faster heart rate slower heart rate when you're even when you're asleep when you're the heart it seems to be an indication of some kind, but not a... Is it like an emotion? It, well, that's what we call emotion. We call emotion. But it seems that it has more than emotion because, as you just said, the person had all kinds of um, cravings. cravings and things that... And I think she, he actually got with the woman's, the man's wife. And these, he liked these things. I think he went. Okay. Research. All right. So it, it doesn't make that much of a difference to us right now. For our 
practical purposes, we're just saying that Chazal at the Torah knew very well when they said that Tefillah is a Vodisha Belev. That means we have to harness all of those energies in the heart, whether it's emotional, intelligent, emotional, whatever it is, and together with the mind, focus it and connect to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. Now we do this three times a day officially. Three times a day officially. But a person can daven any time he wants. You don't have to have your official chakras, mitra and mairev. If you want to talk to God any time you can, you can do it. There's no, no um, limitations on that. But what's very important is to know this, that the world stands on three pillars. That's we learn in Pirkei Avos. And Torah, we said, is something which comes from the upper world down to us. That's Torah, right? Torah originates in the spiritual world, in the Olam Yonim, and it's given to, given to us, so it comes from up, down. It comes into the mind. We're, okay, but it comes from a higher source, a higher spiritual source. It comes down to our physical world. It comes down to us too. That's going from top down. Now we have Avoda. Avoda, that's our job. <clears throat> a vodah comes from the word evet. We have to serve. We have to serve God. That is going from down up. The avoda is a repre- a a um, a representation or a substitute for the karbanos, which went from down up. It was an offering which we gave up. We don't have that today, so we have in place of that, we have the carbon tormid of chakras, carbon tormid shall be in the afternoon, that's chakras and mincha, and the mayor was left over, said, okay, so we have an offering going down up. Now in the Pasuk, look what it says, at the top of the page in the handwritten, V'avaratam is Hashem Alekechu, U'beirach es when you have the Avodah Shabalev, your bread will be blessed. Excuse me. Yes. It starts at plural, and then it goes to singular. Good kasha. Very good kasha. Very good kasha. I have to think about it. Think the good kasha. You hear what he's asking? Okay. I didn't hear. He says the Pasuk begins <laughs> in Rabim, in plural. Vavadetem. You will serve, you, all of you. Ubeirach is lach mecha, and he will bless your bread. It doesn't say lach mechem, it says lach mecha. Your bread in singular, not in plural. He wants to know, a very good question, why is the tense changed from, from plural to singular? You have to think about it. Okay. I mean, I could, I could give you a teretz, but I don't want to give you a teretz because I just thought of it now. I don't know if it's accurate, not accurate. But I, I, I want to think about it. I'm sure the Mepharshim speak about it. It's too obvious a question. But I, it, it's not no gay to us right now. But it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Okay. Now, if you look at the printed part down below by the Ayin Ches. So we're saying, the Pasuk is telling us that what is going to be the result of, of our avoda, our service to Hashem, that there will be a blessing in our bread. Now take a look at the first line. Ki yidua, she parnasa teluya b'shalosh tefila shel Yisrael. Let me tell you something amazing now. Parnasa, which means providing us for our needs, is dependent on three times a day davening. Ulize amar yihiyu digoncha dag dagan v'yifrochu ki gefen. Okay, he means another person about Dagon and um, blossoming like the, like grapevines. Viadua. I'll tell you exactly what he's what he's, what he's saying. Kiadua, kishem el havaya, alef lamid yud hevafhei. That havaya is just a a short way of saying yud kevafkei. Ole zan. Those two words. 
Aleph Lamed and Yud Hey Vav Hey Hashem's name equal fifty seven. Zion, Zion Nun fifty seven. Fifty seven. Ukamash Kosov, as we say in the Pasik, El Adonai Vayor Lanu. El is the same El, and the He represents the Yud Hey Vav Hey. The Yor Lanu it will enlighten us. Okay, now. If you didn't understand what we just said until now, just think for a moment. How many brachas do we have as one Esrei? 19. 19. How many times a day do we say the brachas? Three times. Shachris, Mincha, Mairev. 57. 19 times 3 is 57. That's Zon. Zion, Nun. The same gematria is 57. We say in Birchus HaMazal every single day, if, if we eat bread, we have to say Birchus HaMazal. We say, Hazon es ha'olam kulo butavo. Right? Hazon es ha'olam kulo butavo. Ki hu el zon. Mm-hmm. Lakol, correct? It's not an accident. No. It's not an accident. It's not a coincidence that the word zon means sustenance Supplying us with our needs is 57, and it happens to be that three times a day, 19 brachos, is also 57. Meaning to say that this is a cause and effect relationship. Davening three times a day brings a pranasa, brings beirach es lachmacha. It brings bracha into your bread. Davening three times a day. Now, he doesn't explain to me all the details. This is a general idea. You have to realize that when Adam Arisham was created, on Yom Shishi, Friday morning, Adam Arisham was created, the world had already been created previously. Everything was set. The stars, the moon, everything. Everything was set in the world. Only one thing was needed to to complete the creation, that was Adam. When he came onto the world, he was created. Hashem blew the neshama into his nostrils and he began to be alive. He saw that the world was not producing. There was nothing growing. Everything was there in potential, but nothing was sprouting. What did he do? He was mispala. He prayed. And when he prayed, all of the agricultural produce which was beneath the surface of the earth began to sprout up. So you needed the Tvila, the Avoda, Shebelev to bring the Parnosa. That's the way the world started. And that's true up until today. This is what the Pasuk is telling us. If you will pray, there will be a blessing in your bread and in your water, and so on and so forth. That's what he means to say over here, that the word zan comes from a combination of two words, el, which is 31, and havaya, yud ke which is 26. 21 and 36 is 57 exactly, zan. V'shem was el Hashem nirmazim ba'osios ochel, now think about this for a moment also. The word ochel. How do you spell ochel? You see it on the page in front of you. Second line towards the end. Ochel. Aleph, Vav, Chaf, Lamed. Correct? Okay. The two middle letters are Vav, Chaf, 26. That's Yudke Vavke. And the two end letters are Aleph, Lamed. 31. That's the El Hashem. Okay. Shem osios el chavav ochel. The mispar shem havaya chavav. The nun, the gematria of your of Hashem's name is twenty six. The heim chasadin gemurim shemehem nishpar panosa tova. The el is the name of Hashem, which represents chesed. El. And it is activated by Yud Kevavke. Together they come down and they are what bring 
the energies which give Parnasa. Rikel is Chesed. It's from the Yud Gimel Mir Tzarachemim. Hashem Hashem Kel Rachum Vachanun. It's the first one. It's the it's the Midah of Chesed. Vahainu Beschus Zayin Brachos. With these fifty-seven brachos, Shalshalosh Vilos is Orer Hashefa Min El Avaya Shaola Misparam Zan. If you have three times a day nineteen brachos, you arouse this koach that exists in the Shem Hashem of El and Havayud Kevavke, which is fifty-seven, and that fifty-seven is Zan is what sustains us, is what gives us the energies that we need. Okay, he brings another Pasuk in Tilim, which again mentions the word Zan twice. Shebekoach Zan Brachos, with the 57 Brachos, Nam Shech Shefa Mishemos El Hashem, comes down energy from those two Sheimos, El and Hashem, Sheimis Bazan. Now, what he doesn't tell us over here is a very important thing. A person, according to this, would only improve his Parnasa if he davens. It doesn't mean that if you don't daven, there's no Parnasa. There are plenty of people in the world who don't daven at all. And they have parnasa. They don't even know what davening is. They don't even know that they're Jewish. They don't really know anything. The, most of the people in the world, I'd say, don't pray. It doesn't say iten It says it says berach. So whatever you get, if you get even a small piece, it'll get you. You have a bracha in the parnasa. Correct, the parnasa. The davening brings a bracha to Manasa. Bracha means that it increases, it's, it's more abundant. So it's a, uh, it's a very big school to daven. Now he doesn't tell you all of the details. We have spoken many times in the Baal Shem Tov also, we have mentioned it as well. And last week we mentioned this, it's very important. Especially during this period when there's the corona and so on and so forth. Not always is it able a person to daven with a minion in shul. Because if a person davens by himself, then there is a slight drawback on davening by oneself. Of course, you have to daven anyway. If you can't get to shul, you have to daven at home. But there's a drawback. What's the drawback of Turvin davens by himself? You're not part of the cloud. That's why it's for well, maybe. You're not part of the cloud. It's always better to be part of the group, not davening by yourself. Why? Because you don't want to have the focus of attention drawn to you. You don't want them to analyze you and look into your, into your file to see if you're deserving or not deserving. You don't want that because we have plenty of things that we do wrong which will end up... <laughs> working against us instead of helping us. But if we dive in as a group, as a whole, then they don't open up each individual file. You take it as a group and you have a better chance of your tefillah being accepted. Therefore, it's always better to dive in with Sibor, with a group. So there's an illustration, does it mean that if you dive in alone, this is not going to happen? If you dive in alone, I, I don't say that. I don't say that. I'm saying that there's a drawback. By davening by oneself is a drawback yeah. that they could analyze you and say, well, you're asking by yourself, you're not asking with the group, maybe we, you're not so worthy, whatever. But we said last week for the Baal Shem Tov a very important piece of information. You're not the only one who's davening by himself. Right. Correct? There are people all over the world People traveling, Hundreds people, of thousands, <laughs> millions, people all over the world who don't have a minion, who live without a minion in the neighborhood. They only have a minion on Shabbos, whatever. In Russia, there are millions. Who knows? So what do you do in such a case? The answer is very simple. 
very important eighth from the Baal Shem Tov. The Zohar tells us a person is where his mind is. That's where the person is, <clears throat> where his mind is. If your mind is to connect with all of those Yechidim, all those people all over the world who don't have a minion, and they're davening by themselves, they're in an airport, they're driving, they're in a cabin someplace, they don't have a minion, there's just no minion around. And you want to connect with all of them. In your mind, you're standing right here, but in your mind you want to connect with all of those people who are single, who are davening all, of the, all over the world by themselves, and you want to unite them with your kavana. That makes a tzibur. This is a chiddush of the Baal Shem Tov. You're not davening alone anymore. You have removed that drawback. You are now davening together with a large group, a big minion. The only thing you can't do is you can't say Kaddish, you can't say Kedusha, and you can't have Kedusha Kriya Satoru. You have to have them all together in one room. You don't have to do that, or in a small area. But you can be connected to all of them, and you have Tfila B'Tzibor, even though you're not together. So you won't have the drawback of davening by yourself. If you have the Kavana, I want to be united with all those people in the world who are unable to have a minion. And I want to be together with them, and therefore you have a Tfila, which is Barabim, and then, it, then it's fine. You, you have removed all the problems that you might have because of davening by yourself. Okay, now, uh, we're up to the last two lines of that first paragraph. Towards the end, Klomar, min el Hashem, Aleph Lamed, Yud Kevavke, Shemis Orim Ayedei, Zan Brachos, these two Shemas of Hashem. You have to realize what he's telling us here, a very important thing. Everything that comes down to this world, the Baal Shem Tov is telling us, the Ben Yishchai is telling us also the same thing, comes through Shemos of Hashem. There's nothing that happens in the air, Stam. Everything is activated by a Yud Kei Vav Kei, by a Shem Hashem. We have the word Rachmanis. Keo Rachum. Rachmanis is not just a, a feeling of mercy that comes down to the world from Hashem. It comes through the letters. It comes through the letters of Rachmanus. Rachum is how it works. That's how it works. Hashem used the letters of the Aleph base to create the world and He uses them to operate the world on a daily basis through the Shemas of Hashem. Through the Shemas of Hashem, the world is being operated. And if you say these words, you're activating them, you're making them more powerful. So when you say these tefillos, 70, uh, 57 brachos, you're bringing down the koach through El Havaya, and it comes out to Ochel, you have what to eat. Chloba min El Hashem, Shemes Orem Ayadei Zan, brachos ha-shelos tefillos. Yotzamaycho, Shem Panasu di Yisrael, Ozeh Omar, and therefore you will have blessing in your bread and in your water as well. Okay, because you need both bread and water to exist. Cannot exist just on, on bread alone. Okay, we have one more paragraph. Meachar, Shagodla, Mailis, Atfilah. Since the value of tefillah is very, very great, not only do we get sustenance because of tefillah, even the upper worlds are also affected by our tefillah. Our tefillahs go all the way up to the top. Even the upper worlds also will be able to receive something from our tefillos down here. This is about Shem Tov told us. Listen, remember. Therefore, it's so important when you're davening, daven in a whisper. 
So even if your own ears do not hear your voice. You hear this, Rabbi Osai? You hear this? This is absolutely amazing. You want God to listen to you? You don't have to speak loudly. He can hear your whispers too. He can hear your whispers. And I'll tell you something, a tremendous, a tremendous Kiddush that the, um, who was it? The Rebbeinu B'chaya, he explains how it was an Imam Shanes. This happened in the base of Migdash. In the base of Migdash, we had the Kohen Gadol, right? And he had the breastplate, the Choshen and the Urim Mitumim. They had all the letters of the Aleph base on them, the names of the Shvatim. And when an important person came into the Kohen Gadol and he had to ask a Shiloh, they didn't know what to do. So they didn't have uh, anyone to go to except to Hashem. They wanted, and since they have the base of Mikdash, they have the Kohen Gadol. You want to get an answer to the Shemaim, that's the best thing. So what would happen? A person who would come in, who would come, let's say, something of national interest, a king would come in. The Melech would come in and he has a Shiloh to ask what to do for Am Yisrael. So he walks in to the base of Mikdash. And the Kohen Gadol is there. And he's wearing the Urim Vitumim, the breastplate with all the letters of the Aleph base. And the Kohen Gadol is facing the Kodesh HaGadoshim. Facing the Kodesh HaGadoshim. So I walk in to the base of Mikdash. I want to ask a Shaila to Hashem Yisbarach. And I want the Kohen Gadol to be the one to deliver the answer. He doesn't see my lips. He doesn't hear me. He sees nothing and hears nothing. He's facing away from me. He's facing the Kodesh HaKadosh. I'm walking him from the outside. I'm facing him looking at his back. I ask the question in a whisper. He hears nothing. He sees nothing. Just knows that I came in. And he's facing the Aron of Kodesh, the Kodesh of Kedoshim, and he looks down and he sees lights begin to light up on the letters of the Aleph base. They stand out. You have all 22 letters. They, some of them begin to become brighter than others. He has to know how to interpret it, to put it together, to make an answer out of the, out of the letters. That was Mineshamayim like a Navua that came down, and the answer came without any sound being uttered. This was Hana, Excuse me? Hana, Correct. Correct. And it's interesting how he made a mistake, Ali. Right. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> I don't know how he did that, but he did it. He made a mistake. He made a mistake. Shekla. Shikor. Shikor Kshera. Okay. But, but that's what happened. That's what happened. That's what happens also when we daven. There's no need for us to hear our self speaking. No need whatsoever. The Zohar says that you dafka should not say it loud enough to hear yourself. But your lips do have to move. They have to form the shape of the letters. And there has to be some kind of sound that comes out, some kind of call. You can, you can trust Hashem that He has sensitive enough ears to be able to pick up what you're saying without any voice coming out. That's what He says of the Zohar. Look what He says again. Second line where the Aleph is, the second, the parry of the kids with the Aleph, second line in the middle. Lakach his hero Bezor Kadosh, Lispalel Balachash, Davin in a whisper, Acha Filu Oznov Lo Tishman Kolo. You don't want your ears to hear your own voice. Why not? Why not? What's so terrible if I say it louder? What's so terrible if I say it louder? Distraction. No. Hatam, who kedei shelo yiskanu bo achitzonim machmas godel maaloseha. 
That's the reason that he gives. He says that what you're saying is so precious and it's so, I would say, elevated, it's so high, it's so spiritual. Jealousy. There are energies in the world, negative energies in the world, kolchos, what we call chitsonim, that become, may become jealous of our ability to say these things, and they may latch on to those words and hold them from going up. We do not want to inspire them with any envy at all. And therefore, we keep them as low as possible so that they don't attract any attention. This is Rabbi Chaim Vital quoting the following. The trilas that go up to Shemayim, all the heavens, only those trilas that are not heard by one's ears. You hear that? Rabbi Chaim Vital in the name of the Arizal. The trila that gets accepted by Shemayim are though those that are not heard by our own ears. <laughs> it's so uh, important and it's so neglected. It, no one gives it any attention. If your mind's saying it, your mouth's not saying it. Why does it have to move? No, you have to say something. Trila is... I, so, can say, I can say it in it, my head. It could be a whisper, and, but you have to move. Tefillah requires deep word, requires speech of some kind. Even though the sound doesn't have to be heard, but the letters have to be formed by, and the air coming out. The letters in the air, it comes out, something has to come out, but not enough so that you can hear it. This is a, this is a, and others say, others say, if you do say it, if you do say it, you're showing that you don't have a muna in Hashem. It's mikat neha muna. Hashem does not need you to scream out. He doesn't need you. He hears everything. If you say it out because you feel that Hashem won't listen, when, when, you're minimizing HaKadosh Baruch Hu's ability. You're saying he can't hear only when you scream out. <clears throat> I had a problem in show with somebody saying very loud, Sukkot de Zimre. I went to him and to the rabbi, and he answered, it's a song, and the song has to be said loud. Sukkot de Zimre is all right. Yeah? We're talking about mostly Shmon Esrei. Okay. The main thing is Shmon Esrei. Now, I will say one thing, that if a person davens loud, by the way, Shmona Esrei, we have no choice. You're not allowed to have Shmona Esrei loud. It must be a whisper. But there's sometimes, let's say, you're not davening the official Shmona Esrei. You're not davening Shmona Esrei. You are going to the coastal at night by yourself, and you have something on your heart, you have to get it out, you want to scream out to Hashem. There was a Chosh uh, of in the south called Rabbi Sh of Shimshon Pincus, very, very famous. In the um, Demona was uh, one of those southern cities. A fellow came to him and he said to him, I think he says that he had no children for many, many years. And then no children. So he says, I'm going to pick you up at 10 to 12. I'm going to take you to a place and you're going to daven. He took him 10 to 12, he picked him up at night, and he took him into some, the way it's explained there, some kind of forest or something, where there was nobody around, nothing. He said, I'm leaving you here, I'm coming back in an hour. I want you to scream out to Kodesh Baruch Hu with all of your might. Every ounce of kayach that you have, scream it out. Not the whisper, scream it out. And he came back an hour later, and meanwhile the person is screaming. The rough told him to do it, so he did it. And within a year he had a child. 
Yeah, 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 so that year. Sometimes it's not a question of whether you, Hashem has the ability to hear it or not. Sometimes Hashem needs you to express it in, with, with, with all the energy that you have to put in to make the tefillah get up there. And it's not an official tefillah of Shachas Mincha and Mayra, which is a private little tefillah between you and yourself. Sometimes you have to scream it out. It's not because Hashem doesn't have the ability to hear it unless you scream. Of course He has. He can hear a whisper also. But there are, there are times where you have to scream, as we learned in, in, in Mitzrayim, by Yitzhak, by Israel. What were the things that got the release? What, what brought it about? They screamed out from the, from the bondage, from the terrible slavery that they were undergoing in the last years before they, before they left. They were screaming out, by Yitzhak, by Israel. It says clearly in the Torah, they were screaming out. So, but that's not the official tefillahs that we're talking about. We're talking about the official tefillahs over here, Shachris, Mincha, and Mayriv. This, says the Zohar, has to be said silently. Silently. Ulechein de Kriya Shema tiknu shiashmiya li Ozno. By Kriya Shema, there it says, Dafka, you have to hear what you're saying. You have to say, Shema Yisrael Hashem, and you have to hear the words. However, when it comes to Shmon Esrei, if the words are said loud, it will not go up. It won't go up. That's what the Chaim Ital says. Why not want it go up? Because the negative energies in the world will become envious, and they'll latch onto those words and the air, and they'll stop it from rising up. However, if if it's so if it's so low that it's a whisper, it's extremely extremely spiritual. more spiritual than the spirit of the person. It's a much higher level than those negative kochos. Therefore, they won't be able to see it. And to hear it and to stop it. There's a hefech svaris marik beis Yosef shepasok sheyoshetov lashmiel as no. He does bring another opinion who says that you should say it loud, but the Zohar does not agree. I am a price of your shalmi timsel kedivarai hefech svarasa v'chein hakori b'sefer Torah chad kori v'chad shasik v'ei trei karan gora mi'amenusa. Okay, I feel that Kriyas Atayra. The same thing also when you get an aliyah and you have the Balkriya, he's saying the words loudly, a person should read along with him in a whisper. Read along with the person in a whisper at the same time. Not two voices heard, one voice heard, that's the way you have to do the Kriya Zatara. Okay. Can't even keep up with something. Okay. <laughs> if you can read along just following it and listening to it, you're also Yodse. But it's better if a person gets an Ali with the Torah that he also reads along the words very, very silently and the Baal Kriya says it loudly, that's that's enough. That's the way it should be. All right. All right, so that's that's this part. Okay. I think we finished this page and it's a very important page to remember. So I would say the following. I'm not so, so I don't I don't know for sure what is the, the best thing to do. If a person has something on his heart and he wants to get it out, he wants to scream out to Hashem, you see in the Torah that Klal Yisrael did it, Mitzrayim. They screamed because of the difficult bondage that they were undergoing. And that's what brought the Geula. That was very, very... I would say influential in bringing about the gula. Finally, it came. So there are times when that's necessary. I don't know when is the time and when is not the time. We're learning here about certainly the three organized tefillahs that we have: Shachas, Mincha, and Esrei. That for sure. 
That for sure is not allowed, even halachically, not allowed to be said. It also be whispered, only whispered. And you shouldn't even hear your own, your own words according to the Zohar. It's clear, that, no question about that. Our only question is when a person is dominating by himself, and he has to get something off Hashem, he wants Hashem to hear him. Is it okay in that kind of a tefillah to scream it out? Or is that also should be said in a very, very whisper? I would say either way is probably acceptable. I'm not so sure which is the best. I don't know. I don't know which is the best. But we know for sure that the organized davening that we have, Shavuz Mincha and Mairev, that has to be said in a very clear whisper, and it shouldn't even be heard by the ears. If it's, if it's possible to do that, it can be done. It can be done. It, take, it takes practice. So what it turns out is the effect is that you're davening more with your mind than you are with your lips. You, you, what is the most active since your lips are not supposed to be saying the words, only whispering the words. That means your mind has to be the most active part. Your emotions and your mind, but your lips are only making a very, very small effort to just enunciate the letters, that's all. And the, what's really making the contact is your mind and, and your heart, that's all. So you have to be very, very active mentally when you're davening Shemona Esrei. And physically, hardly at all. Hardly at all, nothing done at all. When you use Mizraim as an example, were you, are you saying they were playing as minions together? Or no, they, I, no, I, I... They were out on their own. Uh, yeah, I, I think that... Acting in faith. Yeah, I, I, right. Uh, so, you know, I don't have information about exactly how they dive in there, what they... But to scream out in, in agony is, uh, is also a kind of a tefillah. Screaming out in agony. I, I don't know what they did in Mizraim. If they had organized feeling, they didn't have organized feeling, very difficult to know. Very difficult to know. You have to have your know, factual information. Well, who has such information? I don't know where, where it would be found. I, I don't know how it happened there. I don't know. Okay. That's that. Where are we holding now? Oh, we have another five minutes. All right. So I, we, I brought the second page. We'll use the second page next week. But we'll, we can look at the next paragraph in front of us. Look at the next paragraph in front of Ozbeis. The Leos ki atfila kedushasa gedolim od. Since tfila is extremely, extremely holy, it's so holy and reaches the highest echelons in the olamis halyonim. We don't want the kochus of tumah to latch onto it. Therefore, we say it so, so, so softly. He dvarim olam bushim alal lakach tsarich lizaher ba la omra baguf maki v'tahor. You know what he's saying? Very, very important. Before one starts to daven, that he goes to the Shehutim and makes sure that he is clean of all urges. No urges that he has to relieve himself. He should always make sure to go to the Shehutim before davening. You have to have a guf, naki, and tahor. Be as pure as possible. And since you have to be as pure as possible, it's even preferred, according to Kasidus, according to Bukubalim, to go to mikvah before davening. That is the preferred way to do it. A true chassid will always go to the mikvah before davening. Three times a day? No, no. Once in the morning. Once morning. in the morning. But if a person feels an urge, that he must go to the shei with him, don't say, well, I can hold it in. I can hold it in. Chalil v'chas. Nothing like hold, no holding anything in. Distraction. So distraction, your your goof has garbage in it. you got to get out the garbage. You cannot dive into a Kodesh Boko when you're containing all of that waste, the waste matter in you. You have to get it out. You have to be as pure and as clean as possible. Because you're dealing with something which is very, very high. If they doesn't go together. A person should not even attempt to daven and say, well, I could last. The davening doesn't take me that long. No, it's not a way to do it. Your person has to daven properly, without pressure, without distractions, and relieve oneself before one starts davening. 
משום שנאמר, He called me Christ Elokech Yisrael. The person tells us, you must prepare yourself before you talk to God. That's part of the preparation. Cleaning oneself. No waste matter should be left inside the body. Ve'im hispalel tvilasa to eva. If a person didn't do it, he didn't relieve himself, his tvila is considered to be an abomination. To eva, it's not accepted. You're davening to me, and you're not clean, you're not pure. But tzorch lavzolit palel. If you feel an urge during Shmona Esrei, whatever it is, and you continue to daven, you've got a problem. It could be that you would be required to daven all over again from the beginning because your tefillah is void, it's invalid. Depending, of course, on how strong the urge is. Why did they go to the make before? What does it accomplish? Well, it comes to a lot of things. But one of the things that accomplishes is that you're, as he said, since you're dealing with something of the very high spiritual nature, you should be pure. And the, one of the accomplishments of the mikveh is to purify. But you have to use the mikveh in a proper way. People just go to the mikveh and they dunk and that's it. It's not enough. It's not enough. You have to understand what you're doing. You have to have the right kavana when you go into the mikveh. Otherwise, it doesn't have its full impact. It doesn't get the benefit that you're supposed to get out of it. It's a proper kavana. I'll just give you one basic one. One basic one. If a person is holding a, a dead rat in his hand and he goes to the mikvah holding the dead rat, did he accomplish anything? He's inside the mikvah, but he's holding a dead rat. The dead rat is tummy. So you can go to the mikvah a thousand times a day. If you're holding a dead rat, you didn't do anything. You're not purifying yourself. Because you're holding a dead rat in your hand, the dead rat is making your tummy. What does the same symbolize the dead rat? It symbolizes the same thing when a person goes to the mikvah and he doesn't have a kavana of tshuva, but he has all the he's holy. He has a dead rat in him. He's got all his averus that he's that he's been done to the day before, and he has them in. He has all that waste in him. He's got to get out of it. He got to get rid of it before he can talk to God. So, davening. Without a kavana of tshuva, is like going to the mikveh and holding a dead rat at the same time. So that's the basic kavana. Before one goes to the mikveh, a person has to have in mind, I'm going to the mikveh, I want to reconnect with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. That, and I want to get rid of what I have done before, I'm sorry for that. I want to reconnect with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. That makshav, basic makshav of tshuva is necessary for the mikveh to be... Um, you know, effective. That's it. It's very simple. Kavan of tshuva. If you don't have the kavan of tshuva when you table in the mikvah, it doesn't help. It's like going to the mikvah holding a dead rat. It's nothing with nothing. Right? So, so we should. But that's in everything, really. It's the same thing in prayer. Not well, a mikvah is designated specifically for tara. So if you want tahara, you have to be, you have to have tahor in your mind also, and get rid of all of the waste that you brought with you, the various that you spoke before here, the lashon hara, whatever you did wrong, you want to get rid of that. You're sorry for it, and you want to reconnect to Hashem. You want to be a good boy. That's necessary for the mikvah to have its proper effect. Okay, until next week, in Hashem, Rabbi said, maybe a man.